We had a fortune in Chinese today that said, don't forget to be awesome, and then promptly got pneumonia and is not here, so hopefully somebody's taking some pictures. So I am up here to tell you guys about the tokenized income sharing agreement. Uh, my name is Josh Lawler. I am a partner at the law firm Zuber Lawler, where I head our new technology practice. I've been practicing securities law for about 25 years and IP for about 15, and what I want you to take away from this is that this really isn't that hard, okay? We can't make the regulation come to us, but we can go to it, and it's not that hard. So the tokenized income sharing agreement. Um, how many people here heard about Spencer Dinwiddie and what he's doing with his contract? Anybody? A couple people up front. Well, he's basically set up an income sharing agreement. He's done some tokens. He's putting, selling $13.5 million against $16 million of his guaranteed first MBA contract. It's an income share. It's a very basic one. The income sharing agreement's been around for a long time, but it hasn't been the best financial product. It's a liquid, it's risky, it's hard to enforce all those things, but, but if you tokenize it, if you tokenize it, it gets very interesting. Uh, so you can see up on the slide there, um, it's flexible. So Spencer Dinwiddie is an NBA basketball player, but anything with a revenue stream can be turned into a tokenized income sharing agreement. The graduating class of Juilliard could get together and get funds upon graduation against their future income. This conference could, and uh, notably uh, Simon Dixon with uh, Bank to the Future, they're doing this. When he talked about his security that was going to be a share of income that could convert into equity, that's what it is. So very flexible. They're fungible. Like most tokens that are not NFTs, and that should be relatively simple, but the, the catch is that fungibility allows liquidity. Uh, we've got fractional. This is where pretty much anybody can invest in something, and we're seeing in the real estate market a uh, low-hanging fruit of tokenizing real estate. They're familiar, which is to say that it's an income sharing agreement. People understand income and income streams. Fully visible, and this part's key, It, like any other blockchain, it's auditable. It's transparent, it doesn't require trust, and fully automated, which is key. And this is where we go to the regulation. You take as many human fingerprints out of this stuff as possible. On a simple income stream, you can do Exchange Act reporting, and you can do it in an automated fashion. You can send people tax reporting forms to cover the income that goes back out to them as a return on investment. You can do it in an automated fashion. All right. so. Going to the regulation, everybody's aware of the securities laws and uh, how they have presented some difficulties. Um, what you see on the slide there, the top slide, that's where we are now. That's your private offering, that's your 506C, your accredited investors hold for one year. That's currently the moment. And then in parallel, we've got Regulation S, which is you know, overseas offerings. And again, you've got a one-year hold period, uh, which kind of doesn't make the most liquid investment, but it's what we've got at the moment. The next step of that would be Regulation A and a Tier 2 offering exemption. And that is a spectacular little bridge because it allows you to sell your securities to anyone and they become unrestricted securities. The catch is that the SEC has to qualify your offering document first. So far that's only been done once or twice. Uh, but if it's a simple enough product, and notably if you do something like tying it to a share of stock, which you can do with a tracking stock, it's more familiar, uh, and we think we can get that through. And over time, of course, an S1 is what we call an IPO, uh, not to be confused with an ICO, uh, and that would allow for public trading of these and listing on exchanges, et cetera. And then the last one is something that nobody really talks about in the crypto space, the Form S3. You may have heard about a shelf registration statement, and this is where somebody will register billions, literally billions of dollars of securities in advance so that later on they can issue them more easily. And the vision that I would have here would be that there'd be a single company acting kind of as an issuer, as a service, that can put up an S3 and then use that on a service basis to issue many different smaller issuances, all with the appropriate disclosure. Okay, so after you've got the initial issuance, it comes down to secondary sales, and this is your liquidity on your exchanges. So the, the top spot there is a restricted token, that's rule 144, and people may be familiar with it because if you did an ICO, for instance, and things have happened more than a year ago and those tokens are in other people's hands, 
they are actually legal for those other people to sell them to different people. They can be transferred, they're unrestricted. They can't necessarily be on an exchange that's something different. And that's kind of the, the second box there. What hangs us up is that the Exchange Act requires anything that's a securities exchange to follow certain rules, be FINRA registered, uh, et cetera, and arguably requires the securities they trade to do public reporting. So public reporting becomes very important. Uh, nobody can trade without that. With a tokenized income sharing agreement, as opposed to, say, a share of stock, I'm not describing an entire company. I'm describing revenue streams. And depending on what those revenue streams are, that might be very easy. I mean, think about this. You've got to do a profit and loss statement. You know, fine, there's a revenue stream. There's, there's nothing there. There is no balance sheet. Uh, it becomes relatively simple to do. Um, and that then allows registered broker-dealers and FINRA and everybody else to actually make a market in these things, thus some liquidity. Uh, there's a version that you can also do that's on kind of more of a traditional crypto exchange. And it, it kind of, I'm going backtracking, but for the flexibility point, you know, it, it's all what you can imagine on these things. It's, it's a token. It's ultimately a piece of code. I can make that into a share of stock. I can make that into not a share of stock. I can have it be both at the same time. Uh, again, not that hard. So once you've got these things out there, the question becomes, how do you handle potential fraud on the market? And uh, not that I expect he would do this, but let's say our hypothetical basketball player is not Spencer Dinwiddie. His agreement included an income stream from his endorsements and uh, other types of revenue of that nature. And he goes out to a club, and the night before his shoe deal with Nike is going to drop, he uh, tells the bouncer, and the bouncer goes out and trades it. Um, that's that's a nightmare scenario. Uh, that's, you know, if it's a security, it's insider trading. If it's not, it's probably still illegal somehow. So you've got to handle that. And that becomes a spot where we can put into play oracles and artificial intelligence to analyze trading patterns. We can work things into our contract, because remember, tokenized income sharing agreement is a contract, so we can put in whatever we need to, such that it's actually able to be rolled back very much as if, say, the Ethereum uh, fork were agreed to in advance. Okay, so then you've got tax compliance, and you know everybody's always uh, a big fan of tax compliance, and you know the IRS is doing their thing with property, which is what it is. Um, but I think what needs to happen is it just needs to be easy. And again, that's the theme, is that this should all be easy. So what makes it easy? Answer, if you're sending somebody funds, you also send them a tax reporting form, very much the way your bank does now, and you get a little thing for interest if you, you know, earned $5 on the year. Um, that's going to be absolutely key, because the key to adoption, again, is ease. OK, so all of that came up with the acronym myself, Smart Contract Issue Administration Reporting Company. Um, so as you know, I'm a lawyer. That means I'm looking for legal engagements. But we're putting together a small side project uh, called SciArc. And the idea of SciArc is going to be issuance as a service. Uh, so very much like just an infrastructure play, we take care of everything that needs to be done other than creating the income stream. Uh, but it enters into the initial contract with the sponsor, we'll call it, who does the income. Uh, it then issues the token uh, on a, a code agreement, has that audited, uh, maintains Exchange Act reporting, maintains tax reporting, uh, acts for dispute resolution, uh, and uh, onwards. Um, the underbelly of it is a little bit more complicated, and I won't get into that too much, but uh, that's kind of the vision. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, it is starting to happen. I'd just like to see it more in a, a systematic format. I think I've got a little extra time because I spoke too fast, so if anybody's got any questions, I'll definitely answer them. Um, and if not, then uh, you can enjoy your coffee. <laughs> yes, sir. Sure. So the idea is that anyone, uh, like, you know, for instance, the Bad Crypto Podcast, for instance, um, can take funds up front on an agreement that they are then going to pay off a, a larger amount later. And it can be done in, you know, a version that looks like debt, a version that looks like equity, whatever it's going to be. They then would enter an agreement with the company, SciArc, and SciArc would then take that underlying income sharing agreement that they entered into with Bad Crypto, 
and create a tokenized income sharing agreement version. And that's going to govern the tokens that actually get sold to the investors who are going to be purchasing. Uh, and then that tokenized income sharing agreement paves the way for delivering income. And for instance, it can be done daily. So, you know, this is tokens. Funds go in through the entire system, come out possibly through stable coins. But there's no reason why people should need to wait for a quarterly dividend to be distributed and have boards of directors that need to do them and everything of that nature. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, this is also about insurance. And that is ensuring that the token that somebody is purchasing is actually valid and has done diligence and is not a scam. And you would know that because if it were, Cyark wouldn't be doing it because Cyark would get in a great deal of trouble. <laughs>